history into 30 minutes proved to be uh, a pretty good challenge. Uh, I did it the first time and it was way too long and so we cut it back. So I would encourage you to check out the book. All proceeds go to support Tope Log. Um, and then the other thing is that a lot of the pictures that I put in this presentation are ones that didn't make the book for one reason or another. So I'm trying to show you something different if you've already been through it. So I'm going to talk about the five lodges, Nomachoke, Agamong, Emet, Winchek, and Abnaki. And then Dave Paulson is going to come up and he's going to talk about the great work that he's done on Tolpe Lodge. So you'll really get a wonderful cross-section of the history of the Order of the Arrow in our area today. So, real quick, where did this come from? How did this start? Back in 2008, when we were preparing to go to the National Order of the Arrow Conference, they wanted all the lodges to put together a display of their history. And sort of the thought was patches, neckerchiefs, things like that. And uh, the scouts at the time wanted to do that. And I naively had no idea the undertaking that, that we were taking on. And I probably hit up 80% of you in the room today for patches and neckerchiefs and things like that, which are on display over there. But a byproduct of that process of trying to build that repository of the, the tangible history of the lodge was encountering all the people that had participated in, in building OA in our community over the years. And it quickly became clear to me that, that that's the real history, that's the real story. And, and that's where this document has sort of come from. So. Indian Lore Marifetch book. So, 
When Indian War Marifat was created, he wrote that book. He wrote another book on regalia making uh, for the BSA, one of the BSA uh, library aids books that came out in the 30s. And he is a recipient of the Distinguished Service Award. And he received that at the 1961 NOMAC. So really uh, a fascinating guy. Uh, he was in Fall River from 38 to 42, and then he went to Fitchburg and became a scout executive there. And he started the Watanic Lodge, and he stayed there for the rest of his career. So it really it, it makes a lot of sense with his background and interest in Native American culture. And this was a lifelong passion. To the day he died, he was going to powwows, and he was uh, selling regalia out of his home in Fitchburg, and all these things. So for him to start the Order of the Arrow in Fall River when he arrived uh, made a lot of sense. And actually, I reached out to his family, and they didn't have much left, but they had his vigil certificate. And I'm going to give this to you, Dave, before we leave today, and you can have this to the collection. So, unfortunately not from Novichok, from Guatetic, but still a great piece of history. So this is the uh, original charter for Novichok Lodge, 1938. The, the fact that this survived is amazing, and the reason that it survived is Bob O'Connor. And the first time that I went to meet with Bob, uh, it was actually Rick Pierce and Jerry Boulay who told me that I needed to go see him. Uh, he told me that he had this hanging on the wall upstairs, and he gave it to me that very day to bring to the lodge. And then, consequently, uh, I think several years later, Elliot and I were rummaging around, and we found all the charters from 38 to 49 in a bag, in a closet in his house. And the lodge has those uh, somewhere too. So just a great, great history that uh, Bob preserved. And uh, of course his legacy is renowned in this area. So the first ordeal was August 6, 1938 at Camp Nelkinjo. We know that from this article on the left which was in the uh, Fall River Herald. And they talk about the fact that they're adding this new program, the Order of the Arrow, that it's a national program, that the first ordeal is going to be that night. And they talk about this guy on the right, John Foley, who was an Eagle Scout from Fall River and on the camp staff. And they describe him as the lodge chief. Now, the ordeal hasn't happened yet. So I, I think in today's terms, you might think of him more as the Camp OA coordinator. He was obviously the staffman that Manning had tasked with overseeing the OA, uh, but he's listed as such, and he's certainly the first youth that oversaw the OA, so we list him as the first lodge chief of the lodge. <coughs> so we don't know a lot about the lodge in the early years, okay? But we do know that it was active and that it was happening. This is a camp program from 1939. If you look at Friday, you'll see it says Order of the Arrow Call Out every week. So it's in the program, we have the charters, and we have newspaper articles that talk about the fact that they did a tap out and then so and so uh, was tapped out at the time. So I think in these early years, it's very much a camp organization. It's not happening outside, there's no OA program happening outside the confines of the summer camp season. And I really don't think that there was any sort of elected or organizational structure at this time, other than the fact that they would do the tap outs and that they would do the ordeals. Now, another interesting fact is in, in the late 30s and early 40s, the New Bedford Scouts were also camping at Novichoke. And we know for a fact that many of those New Bedford Scouts were inducted into the Nokachok Lodge as well. So we have articles uh, from 1945 talking about uh, who was tapped out, 1943, talking about who was tapped out. And the scout executive at the time was a guy named Bob Hambridge. And it describes in the article that he was acting as Alouette Sakima and doing the tap outs. And then at the very end of the season, in the last kind of wrap up, in the article, they said that there's going to be an organizational meeting for the Order of the Arrow for the purpose of electing officers and creating a meeting schedule. And then reading the, the papers forward into early 44, we find the article describing that meeting and the election of officers. And I think that that is really the start of, of the real um, 
organization of the lodge and the first officer groups and a regular meeting schedule. <laughs> and this guy, Robert M. Hammond Jr., uh, was elected lodge chief in 1944. Actually, John Hammond's father over here was elected lodge secretary that year as well. And then we can account for every lodge chief from 44 to the end in 72. So I really think that this is where it started to be something more than a ceremony that they did at summer camp, 1944. So this guy was the son of the lodge chief. And his father had been the assistance guy executive in Springfield before they moved to Fall River. And he earned his eagle in Springfield. So I think, and I don't know, but I think it might be safe to assume that he was probably in the OA in Springfield. We know that that's the first lodge that was started, and that might, that might account for why he was elected chief, because maybe he had some sort of background. So, this is awesome. I got this from John's father many, many years ago. This is the earliest known image of the OA at Camp Nomichoke. And I date this to about 1944. This right here is John's father. And I reached out to the Hambidge family, who was the scout executive at the time. And the scout executive, of course, is dead, and the lodge chief was dead, but I found the grandson. And he said, coincidentally, I have this big box of color slides from Camp Novicho in the 1940s. And oh, by the way, there are several OA images in there, too. I'll send them to you. Recognize this? So, this right here is Ernie Picard, Jack Reagan, Dave Hill, Bob Hamage, George Hill, Mr. Hindus. I think that this is Tony Aguilar, Judge Aguilar from Taunton. And I think that that's Kendall Hamage, the younger brother of, uh, of Bob. Now, look at Look at this bonnet here that Mr. Hindus is wearing. You see the yellow tails on the end? 75 years later, I took this in John's kitchen. There's his dad still wearing the original bonnet from that picture before. And I think he has the whole, does he still have the whole regalia of it? This was the original ceremony site for the lodge. And then this was in the paper in May of 45 of uh, the Lodge officers. So really from this point forward, the OA has become an active and engaged entity in uh, council operations, and, uh, and they're just moving forward. from that first initial meeting in 1944 and acted with the Lodge right up until his death. In the whole history of the Lodge, only two other people were ever Lodge advisor. A couple years in the 50s, a guy named Ken Ledger, and then at the very end, a guy named Dave Melanson. This guy uh, did the OA from day one, and whether he was Lodge advisor or not, actively engaged, and also the first vigil honor recipient of the Lodge in 1956, and he got it at the area conference in Maine that year because there was nobody locally to do it. So he got it at the conference. So very key to, uh, to the program and its sustainability in Fall River. This picture on the left here is from 1949, and the stone that these kids are holding is the one that they sent to E. Erner Goodman in Vermont he was constructing a fireplace at his farm there, and he asked all the lodges to send an indigenous stone to be placed to build this fireplace. And uh, these, the guy kneeling on the right and standing on the left were twin brothers, the McLeans, and then on the left is Charlie Harrington, who was lodge chief, and top right, Norman Method, who coincidentally was Ed Tavar's college roommate later. And then on the right, we have a, a ceremony from the early 50s. Uh, at Nova Cho, which was also amongst those slides that were sent. So by the 60s, uh, Lodge is a well-oiled machine, very active. Um, we've got an ordeal ceremony uh, up there at the top. And then you can see the overhaul that they did on the ceremony site 
as opposed to the one that I showed you uh, earlier from the 40s. And, and you can see that these candles you know, are pictured at the top there too. That could very well be Rick Pierce there. I don't know. You can see him squinting and looking hard. Uh, but we, uh, I think these might have been in the pictures. Were these in the pictures that Vic pulled out of the dumpster, maybe? So, uh, cool stuff. So into the 60s, uh, these were Lodge Chiefs, Jeff Mather, Ray Mello, uh, Lenny Freeman, uh, kind of led the, the Lodge through the end of that era. The Lodge hosted the Conclave, one and only time, 1965, at Novichok. This is a, a copy of the Lodge newsletter, the Peace Pipe, shameless plug number one. If anyone has any paperwork like this, we would love to get copies. We don't need to take it from you, just a nice high-res scan would be wonderful. Uh, this stuff came out of a, a box that Mike Vera found in his attic just a few months ago. So uh, this is new to us and some wonderful information about the lodge at sort of the end, the transition period, the murder with New Bedford, uh, and what was going on there. And then this is Ken Rundricks who was the last chief of Nomicho and uh, the first co-chief of Niman. Uh, very, very active. He and Mike Vieira were the spearheads of leading the lodge in those final years. And uh, uh, Ken still stays active. He was at our reunion in Yagu, and I, I thought he was going to try to be here today, but uh, great, great legacy there as well. And then this was interesting. So Nomicho was supposed to host the conclave in 72, but the merger happened, right? So this patch on the right, many of you are probably familiar with, this is a stock national design. This was the patch for the 72 Conclave, and you'll notice that it says Niemann. But over here, and this was in the box of stuff that uh, Vieira had in his attic, here was the original design uh, pre-merger. So I thought that that was, uh, that was really neat. Much better looking, too. So, New Bedford, right where we are. So, the origins of the New Bedford Lodge are a little unsure. So the first reference of the OA in New Bedford that I found is an article from 1945, where it said that uh, commissioners from the New Bedford Council were going to go to Camp Nogachoke to observe the OA for the purpose of looking at creating their own lodge. That's the only reference I ever found, and I don't think that uh, anything ever came of it. We know because we have council camping committee, min camping committee meeting minutes, we have newspaper articles, and we have first-hand accounts from charter members that the Agawam Lodge that we know started in 1960. And we have at least one charter member of the lodge in the room today. Here's the rub. Dennis Wilkinson has this picture in his archive. We've gone back and forth on this for years. This is a color slide. You notice that sign at the front that says Agawam Lodge Order of the Arrow? Well, this slide is stamped 1959. Can anyone in this room tell me where this sign came from and when it was? Okay. So, I guess there are, there are lots of possibilities. Yeah, it could be that, that uh, the, the number 509 correlates to a chartering in 1954. Okay? The national organization was pushing councils to adopt the Order of the Arrow. I suspect that uh, the scout executive in New Bedford uh, agreed to do a charter to get them off his back and nothing happened. So, possibly in 54 they started, they tried to start and it never went anywhere and it failed. Maybe by the summer of 59, they knew that they were going to be starting in the new year, and they made that sign to promote it at summer camp. Uh, your guess is as good as mine, but, but this has been something that's uh, haunted me for some time. So here's the newspaper article from the New Bedford paper talking about the creation of uh, Agawam Lodge in 60. And then the guy on the right there is Mike Lopes, who was an Eagle Scout from Fair Haven, who was the first chief of the lodge, and also, consequently, the first commander of the Knights of Dunamis chapter that New Bedford had, which was the precursor to the, uh, 
and National Eagle Scout Association. Does anyone know who's on the left? Cash a lot, guys. You know? Okay. This picture is dated 1960. This is on the hill up to the dining hall. Bill Hewitt from the camp staff on the left. Nick Cianciola from the professional staff on the right. Again, can anyone identify that individual in the middle? Nope. All right. Well, I had to try. <laughs> so here we go. This is uh, probably in the first year. They're all wearing ordeal sashes. Um, third from left, Dennis Prefontaine. Raise your hand, Dennis. Um, you might still have that outfit. Break. We'll wear it every Halloween. So uh, this is the uh, original leadership. So Nick Cianciola, staff advisor. George Pimentel would be a lodge chief. Dennis Prefontaine would be a lodge chief. Paul Con Conti. And then Larry Bebo was a three-term chief of the lodge. So I suspect many of you uh, recognize these names. Great photo. Roger Gates was the lodge advisor of Agawam. The first lodge advisor was Ed Spencer, Hall of Fame uh, recipient. Ed was involved in the Order of the Arrow in Fall River, and that's probably um, why he got that role, and he was involved in that first year or two of getting the lodge off the ground and started. But then by probably 62, Roger Gates became lodge advisor, and he held that role uh, for the entire tenure of the lodge until uh, 1972. So here are just some, uh, some neat photos from Agawam. They sent a contingent to NOAC in 61, Larry Bebo, Dennis Prefontaine, and Anthony Poenti. They drove out in uh, Mr. Bebo's station wagon, cross country, out to uh, Indiana University. And then on the right is a snapshot of the Lodge Ceremony team, Circuit 63. I think that's is that your front yard, Dennis? Uh, here in New Bedford. And the Agawam Ceremony team would really uh, be very successful and would compete actively at the conclaves and, and win uh, the top awards. So dance and ceremonies was definitely a major component uh, of the Agawam Lodge and they were successful at it. Was this the only picture on the slide? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Roland Dupont, uh, lower left there with Charlie Humphreys and Dennis Prefontaine. Roland, uh, Lodge Chief. Very, very active arrowman. I had the pleasure of knowing Roland before he passed. Really great guy. He went to tremendous lengths to help us with this history. And uh, he gave a lot of the items that are on display over there. And I was very excited about what we're doing. And here's, I think this was the father son banquet uh, for the lodge. And then you might recognize these plaques. Uh, these were hanging in the dining hall at Cashawa. But this just gives you an idea of some of the stuff, the contributions that the Lodge did for the Council, and you can see the uh, campfire ring at camp, and then the gateway, and the gateway that they're referencing here is the famous Texas Towers gateway that they used to have, and I know Dennis has pictures of that, and it was uh, quite, quite the thing. Um, Mr. Breitman, raise your hand. Took this picture with him. Um, so, you know the Agawam flap, the blue flap with the whale. Well, the second flap with the, uh, the whale ship and the harpoon, which you can see back there, was a patch design contest that the lodge did. And Mr. Brightman submitted three designs. These are the other two on the left, but he won. And I believe you said that you want to watch. Yes. You want to watch for having the, uh, the winning design. And uh, of course, his flap uh, was the one that was produced. And then here he is holding the first place dance team trophy from the 1965 area conference where the lodge brought home the goal. So this is just a great story that, that I have to tell you. So Dennis Prefontaine was lodge secretary, lodge vice chief, lodge chief, area vice chief, area chief. Okay? Uber, Uber involved. And the lodge in 1969 nominated Dennis for the Distinguished Service Award, which is, of course, the highest award that you can get in the Order of the Arrow. And they hold on to those nominations, I think, for a three-year cycle. And in 1971, Dennis was selected to receive it at the National Order of the Arrow Conference. Well, by that time, 
He graduated from school, and he was working for the Boy Scouts in Maine, and he was running summer camp. And apparently, nobody told him that he was supposed to get this significant award, and I don't remember where the NOAC was that year, maybe Indiana, uh, you know, on stage in front of three to 5,000 people. So he wasn't there, and he found out about it after the fact. So he's working up in Maine. So a guy from the National Committee of the Order of the Arrow decides he's going to come over to Maine and present this to Dennis at like a round table or a district committee meeting, something like that. Well, Dennis decides to have some oral surgery on that day and doesn't make the meeting, so it doesn't get presented to him again. So I think, at latest, this is maybe 2013, 2012, 2013, at the, uh, at the Abnaki Lodge Banquet, we finally formally presented Dennis Prefontaine with his Distinguished Service Award. So we brought closure uh, to that, and uh, we even were able to get an original certificate from uh, 1971. So, great moment. Shameless plug number two. Now we've got a lot in your bed for people in this room. Any of these, anywhere, this is the Lodge newsletter, the GAM. We have turned up maybe three of these. They've got to be out there somewhere. They've got to be. If you have these, we would really, really love to get copies. Uh, Dennis told me that he had a binder with a complete run of all of them. And I've personally been to his house three times. I've been in his crawl space, his attic. I've been in the closet under his stairs. I've rummaged around in the snow. And I talk to him probably once every other week. And every conversation starts with, did you find him yet? And it's been 10 years. So if you have anything like that, please, please let us know. We would love to get copies. Just let, let Dennis know, and, uh, and he'll get them to us. And I think, Mandy, you have this neckerchief slide, right? Yeah. It's the only one we've ever seen of those two. Now, I think this will be a different story. If you were an EMAP watch, raise your hand. Yeah, that's what I do. All right. So, EMAP watch is obviously the merger of Nokichoke and Agawam. 1972, my understanding was that both councils were sort of struggling financially and, and agreed to merge. And EMAP uh, was chartered in April of 1972. My, uh, we found a totem pole that says that Jerry Gamash, who I think was from Fall River, uh, came up with the name Neman. Supposedly in the Wampanoag it means uh, my brother. And I believe that this flap was designed by Tony Pollard, who is a big, uh, yeah, that's correct, was a big uh, scout scouter here in the council. So the first year, the chiefs of the two previous lodges, uh, Ken Rodericks from Fall River and Aaron Lansky, yeah from uh, New Bedford, co-chaired the Lodge. Um, this is the original charter, 1972. And also at this time, this guy, Bob O'Connor, who had been very involved in the Order of the Arrow and for years and years and years, but never the Lodge advisor, he became the Lodge advisor of the new NEMAT Lodge and he held that role for the next 16 years. So this is volume one, issue one of the NEMAC News, which was the first newsletter. And this describes a, a pretty bleak picture. It talks about the fact that the new lodge is fractured and that for all intents and purposes, it's sort of operating as two entities. The old Agawam group and the old Novacho group are sort of doing their own thing. Uh, under this one umbrella of EMAP, and that things are not going well, and that, the, that they need to get it together. And I think that this is a common thread that you see in mergers, you know, even today. You know, you're trying to merge two separate cultures into something new, and as we all know, as human nature, it's hard to let go of your old habits and traditions. So, in 73, the first chief elected uh, to an EMAP was Jeff Walker. Here today. So here's a great photo of the EMAP Lodge Executive Committee. I believe that this is at Camp Nomecho, 1975. That's Brian Briga at the front, chief that year with Bob LeCompte. So we 
found this. This is from the early 1970s. This was a newspaper article. It says it was a, a Massasoit Council, a Massasoit District Camporee. You can't identify any of these people. Does anyone recognize anyone in here? And I really thought we were going to come up with some of these names here today. I was all excited. I think, have you posted this one too? Yeah. The uh, OA uh, trail crew at Philmont, the lodge sent contingents in both 85 and 89. John, I think you're in one of these, right? 85. Uh, great program, and you know, Newman Lodge was always small, but decidedly active. And I think that this is a great example of uh, getting out there and taking advantage of national programming, and obviously they sent pretty good groups. The, uh, Camp <laughs> Association Minister of Propaganda here, Ms. Wilkinson. I think that's, uh, is that Lou Lopes next to you? It is. So this is a dance team competition at which conflict? I think that's 85 at Greeno. 85 at Greeno. So uh, I think you should break this bad boy out and uh, we, we can reprise this role <laughs> that we want. I'm not as spry as I used to be. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I'll call Dennis him Wilkinson get him over is here. the first multi-term chief in NEMAT in 1986. Several significant things happened during his tenure as chief. Uh, number one, the 50th anniversary of the lodge, and I think that they did a, a major, major event uh, around that out in camp, which uh, took some significant planning. And then the second thing was that this was the transition from lodge advisor, where Bob O'Connor stepped down, and Daryl Sylvia, I know he's in here somewhere, Daryl Sylvia took over uh, as lodge advisor um, for NEMAC. And then also the Spring and the Scouting program, which I think is probably one of the, the real significant contributions of the lodge to the council, was started in, in 1990. And I know it was you, Dennis, Tom Bednarz, and Kurt Gubel who uh, put that together. And that program was about you know, improving uh, people as a scout transition. And they could do this wonderful weekend out of camp, and it was so successful that it ran for 12 years. So, uh, and I can tell you that that little patch right there, you wouldn't think it was tough, but trying to find every single one of them was a real, real bear. Um, but they're over there if you want to see. So here are just uh, some chiefs of EMAC uh, in succeeding years. Are any of these gentlemen in the room? No? Okay. Uh, I'm sure that these are familiar spaces to most of them. And then, as I mentioned, uh, Daryl Sylvia took over as lodge advisor and held that post into the mid 90s. And then the last chief, I mean, uh, last advisor of NEMAP was Mike Vieira, and he held that mid to late 90s up until the merger uh, in 01. So the last chief of NEMAP was Justin Coster. He was a two-term chief, and he helped oversee uh, the transition from um, NEMAP, uh, the merger with Winchek. Here are just some photos uh, from kind of the end of the NEMAP tenure. Anyone know who's on the right? Cool. This is pretty recent. No one knows? Can we look at that later? Yeah. You have a closer look yeah. at it later? Yeah, please. I know that these are the Vivos in this picture on the left, right? Of course, Larry was very big in, uh, in Agawam. And I think, was he not, was he an advisor to the dance team at EMAP? Larry Vivo? Larry was, So in, um, in 2001, uh, the Mobile Council and the Narragansett Council merged. Uh, so this was the last charter for NEMAP Lodge, the 2001 charter. And then, shameless plug, again, the totem poles, much more recent. If you have any of these laying around, Jason, uh, we'd love to get some copies of those as well. We've got a bunch of them. Again, Bob LeCompte had, had a great repository of these as well, uh, but I know that there are more out there. So, the order of the arrow came very late 
to the Narragansett Council. You know, surprisingly for a council of its size and activity. Um, the reason for that is that they had their own Camp Honor Society since 1922 called the Winchek Indians. And the national organization had pressured the Narragansett Council for years to adopt the Order of the Arrow because that was the official program of the Boy Scouts. But they continued to hold on to the Winchek Indian program. And in fact, in 1952, the Winchek Indian leadership of the council went to the NOAC as observers to look at it and see if they liked the program and wanted to make a change. And they came back and said that they didn't find the Order of the Arrow compelling enough to change their program. So uh, Winchek Indians was the official program of the Narragansett Council. And Tom Gibney over here uh, was a Winchek Indian uh, as well. So that all changed because of this guy right here. And Norm Wood is uh, an Eagle Scout from Springfield, Massachusetts, chief of the Allegoghen Lodge. But more significantly, he was the first, for lack of a better term, the first director of the Order of the Arrow. I think it might have been called executive secretary or not, but he was the first professional in the BSA to be in charge of the Order of the Arrow. And when he left that role, he came to the Narragansett Council and started pushing uh, for the adoption of the Order of the Arrow. Now, the scout executive in Providence at that time was a guy named J. Harold Williams. And if you've ever heard about him, yes. a real ego uh, is uh, what I've heard. And I think since he created the Winchek Indians, I think he was not overly excited about the idea of making a change. But Wood pushed hard, and uh, in 1958, the Council Executive Board did agree to adopt the Order of the Arrow and give up uh, the Winchek Indians. So that first year, 58, and we have the document, it's over in the book here, they said that all members of the Winchek Indians could convert to the Order of the Arrow. Now they had their own sort of ordeal. So they didn't have to retake the ordeal, but they had to go through the ceremony. And the document specifically states that you could only make that transition the summer of 1958. If you didn't do it then, then you had to go and do the ordeal all over again. So that first year, that first summer of 58, was just education and conversions that summer. And Tom Gibney over here, I know, converted that first year. The, the first lodge meeting was in November of 59, and they elected this guy on the left, Bob Morris, as the first lodge chief. And he had come from uh, Manitoni Lodge, was what camp? Camp Sachem. He'd come from Camp Sachem, where he had been involved in the Order of the Arrow there much sort of like the Hambridge thing that I described earlier. And I think that that's probably very much why he got elected uh, chief. And his best friend over here, Francis Bessie, uh, those two were very much sort of the driving forces of the lodge in that first full year of 1959. The tap-outs, the ceremonies, uh, the program, which was all happening during the summer camp season at Yagu. It wasn't like how we do it today, where they were going to the troops and doing elections, and we'd have ordeal weekends. It all happened at camp. Oh, yeah. so, this is an awesome picture. Um, I, I, this was the other one that was almost the cover of the book. Uh, Tom Gibney, over here, raise your hand, Tom. Tom was chief of Winchek in 60 and 61. Like I said, he was a Winchek Indian. They converted over that first year. He's on the far right. And this is the ceremonies team for Winchek. And Tom also had that uh, stash of color slides. Uh, from that era of which, of which this was one. And just a great, great photo. So the two guys in the middle are twin brothers, okay? And one of them is still living, and I reached out to him, and I sent him this picture, and I said, which one's you? And he said, I have no idea. <laughs> so, so in the book, I just picked, I figured I had a 50-50 chance that if, if he didn't know, no one else was gonna know. But uh, just a great, great photo. So I included this one because of the New Bedford connection. This is the 1967 Winchek Lodge banquet. And this is Dennis Prefontaine, of course, from New Bedford, who was visiting the, uh, the banquet in his capacity as area vice chief that year. Now, Winchek hosted the conclave this year, 67, and it was at this conclave that Dennis got elected area chief. So I suspect 
It was public at the event. But I, not a great photo, but I wanted to include it there. These are uh, two lodge chiefs from the late 60s, Jay Burdick and Paul Boisberg, who sort of ran the lodge um, from that era, 65 to 70, sort of. This is, uh, again, not a great photo, but um, the leadership of the lodge at that time. And then the, the early 1970s seems to have been a bad era for Winchester Lodge. We have very little documentation. In fact, we don't know who the lodge chief was in 1973, which is interesting because the lodge chief in 74 and the lodge chief in 72 are both living, and no one can remember who was in the middle. Um, so I think that 1970, uh, 1, 2, 3 was sort of a dormant era. I'm not sure that there was a lot going on. And that sort of changed in 74 with this guy on the right and Kevin Bowling. And what's significant about it is we would go on to have four lodge chiefs almost in succession from the same troop, troop 17 and four. So in this picture, you've got Kevin Bowling on the right, who was chief in 74 and then was area chief in 75. In the middle, you have Rick Poirier, who still works for the Mayflower Council, and he was chief in 77. And then on the far left is Gary Butler, who was the Deputy Chief Scout Executive of the Boy Scouts of America, and he was chief of Winchester in 78 and 79. And then there was a fourth guy from this unit, Jim Radcliffe, who was also chief of Winchester. So this one particular unit really did a deep dive into the OA and were uh, responsible for turning it around and, and making it an entity again. And my granny, I think that was your troop, right? So uh, into the 80s, the lodge is uh, picked up again. This was uh, the lodge leadership for uh, early 1980s. This is uh, Rick Cavallaro on the right, uh, lodge chief and uh, visual honor member, very, very active, engaged. And then on the, the right image here is the Newport Trail. So Winchick Lodge put together a trail for the scouts, and I believe that you can still do this today. I think the council still. Is that correct? The council still has the paperwork. But Gary Butler, who I mentioned earlier, developed this trail through Newport, and there was a medal that you could earn. And this was the ribbon cutting in, in downtown New, Newport for this trail. Uh, the mayor was there, it was a big, big to do in the community, and that was the chief at the time, Bert Lawrence, uh, doing the ribbon cutting and the unveiling of this trail. I would encourage your units here, if they have not done this trail, it's a great opportunity and, uh, and it would be fun. And then, believe it or not, those last years of Winchek, there isn't a lot of documentation, surprisingly. Um, we know that the guy in the middle here, Steve Legassi, was a three-term chief, and uh, the only three-term chief uh, of Winchek Lodge. And then you've got Joe Amball on the right, who was a two-term chief and a section officer. And then, of course, Bob Serhall on the far right, he's over there still um, for along the back wall. He was a lodge advisor of Winchek and uh, still actively involved in the Order of the Arrow today. And, Silver Buffalo received. And, and let me just got to put in a quick aside about this, this guy. So he's the only Silver Buffalo recipient I know, council president on every national committee under the sun. He shows up to every OA event and he goes straight to, doesn't say a word to anyone, and he goes to the dirtiest, nastiest clan project that's going on. And he just works in that clan all day long, doesn't say a word, and then leaves before anyone can catch him. Never fails, to this day, right? Servant leadership at its best. Okay. So Justin Coster was the last chief of Neiman, and he described uh, the merger situation to me between Neiman and Winchester. And he said that they held a meeting at the council office in Providence, and everybody was invited to come. And he said, just as you would suspect, the turnout was sort of lackluster. They removed the adults from the room, and the kids were placed in a conference room and told to come up with a name. Okay? So the kids that were there somehow came up with Abnan. Okay? And the number 102 is a defunct lodge from California that goes back to the 30s. So that lodge, 102, is a California lodge that existed from the 30s to the 90s, went under, and they took that number because it represents January of 2002, which was the chartering of Abnaki Lodge. The reason that I want to make this point, 
because I've heard this for years. People are ticked off that they didn't retain the 124 number, and people are ticked off that they didn't retain the wind check name. The reason I'm telling you this is, this decision was made wholly by the youth, which means it was right and beyond reproach. So, and, I, and I've heard grumblings from both sides on this, but Justin made it very clear that the kids made this decision, and it's their lodge. So, here's some paperwork from uh, the first year, and you can see this is a document that went out and signed by Justin as NEMAT Lodge Chief and Brian Turquetta as Winchet Chief, talking about the transition. And then you can see on the right there, it says, take it off. I want everybody to get the NEMAT and Winchet flaps off their uniforms, and let's unify under the new uh, Abenaki name. So again, surprisingly, not a lot of great documentation of those very first years of Abenaki. Uh, I think much like we saw with NEMAT and uh, Winchek, it was sort of a, a culture clash again. I think that there was some struggle getting together in the beginning. The first lodge advisor was Nikki Jarius, staff advisor was Derek Wirtz, and then this guy on the right, Jim Miller, became the next lodge advisor, and he was from Unami Lodge. <coughs> really tried to inject some of the Unami culture into, um, into Abnaki, and he was working with Jason Dewey, who was the staff advisor uh, at that time. So we know that the Lodge sent contingents to the NOAC in 02, 04, and 06. This is the 06 group, and those two boys on the left would both be Lodge chiefs, Matthew Smith and uh, Jeff Equally. So, January 1st of 2007, Don Hansen uh, was named the new Lodge Advisor of uh, Abnaki Lodge, and I was named the new Staff Advisor. And we really inherited a difficult situation. Uh, the membership was maybe 200, 250 members. We had no money. Uh, it was a real challenge. And not long into that year, the entire e-board, with the exception of the Lodge Secretary, <coughs> resigned. So it sort of gives you a picture of, of what the situation was at that time. There were no chapters uh, like we have now. We have these service areas where it was multiple districts represented service areas. And it, it really was sort of a disaster. We would have lodge meetings and it would be a group of 15 adults and Matt Smith. He'd be the only kid in the room. And it was a miserable situation for him. You know, he didn't want to waste his time coming to run a meeting for a bunch of adults, and obviously he wasn't getting the, the support that he needed. So uh, there was really sort of a, a pervading feeling at the time of sort of us and them. So in the summer of 08, uh, Hansen stepped down, and Michael Brandy, over here, Michael, uh, was appointed Lodge Advisor. And I really think that this was sort of the change and we were talking about this last night. I'll never forget the first executive board meeting where Michael was lodge advisor. Fred was probably there. Um, he decided that we were going to separate the youth and adults. So the kids were going to go into their own room and have a meeting so that they could make decisions for themselves without the influence of the adults. And he sat down to sort of lay out his vision for the lodge to the adults. And he's talking and they keep cutting him off. You can't do that. That's not the way we do this. Now, if you know Michael, he's patient, but he's not that patient. And uh, he exercised uh, great, great restraint. And I remember he said, well, uh, the way we've been doing it doesn't seem to be working, so we're gonna give this a try. And he got up and he went and uh, dealt with the kids. And then that night, uh, he called up those individuals who did not want us to do things differently. And he said, I want to thank you profoundly for the difference that you made and the contributions that you've made and the time and effort that you've committed. I want you to know that you're always welcome at our events and I encourage you to come. But if I ever see you in an e-board meeting again, I'm going to show you the door. And I think it's things like that that it's leadership. And you, you sometimes you have to make some tough and controversial decisions to get changed. And we really started to grow. The dues flap that we all did do now, Tolpe still does it, that was created then. The Aeroport program was created then. Our membership went from 200 and something to uh, 
850, almost 900. Uh, we started making money in the trading post and able to reinvest into the camps and the programs. And things really, really started to take off. And uh, it was an exciting time to be a part of the lodge. Michael always talked about creating high-functioning teams. And we had a great group of adults. And what was so fun about it, you've all been there with your troops, when you enjoy each other's company and you socialize and you're having a good time together, we had a great, great group. Fred Barreros was a key, where is Fred? Fred was a key, key part of that team. Fred was the chapter manager for what was then the Cashel chapter. And remember, this was a time where we were trying to overcome these differences and this strife. And, and this area out here was really reluctant. And it was Fred who went door to door with those troops. And he said, I hear you, I know it, but this is me. This is me. I'm from here. You know me. I'm your neighbor. I've been in cash a lot with you. I'm telling you, we need to do this. He did a great, great job of building up what became uh, probably the biggest and most successful chapter in the lodge at the time. And then he would go on to be our vigil advisor for a number of years. And I think you, you're still going out and setting up for vigil, aren't you? So here are some of our uh, officers in those early years. And I, what I want to point out is you all might be familiar with Eric Brown on the far right, the little guy on the top. So, Eric was elected Lodge Secretary at the election in 08. He had just finished his ordeal. He, he went through his ordeal ceremony Saturday night, and then Sunday morning he got elected Lodge Secretary. And the next year he got re-elected Secretary, the next year he got elected Vice Chief, and the next year he got elected Chief, and then I think he was Vigil Chief, and every other thing under the sun. And he's still super active and engaged uh, with the Lodge and uh, a big part of it. Just uh, these kids, I, I look at these and I remember them all individually and you know the stuff that we went through. It's just a great, great, great group of kids. So this was the conclave at Treasure Valley in 09, and this is sort of the, the turning point. So to put it into perspective, in 2007, the Lodge didn't send a single kid to conclave, zero. In 2008, Michael took six, six, eight, to the Cape. And then in 2009 at Treasure Valley, we got a big group together, and the Lodge won the Golden Shovel Award, which was the like top overall spirit Lodge Award. And it was really, it, it was a big thing, because we had a terrible reputation, we weren't even coming to conclaves. And they had so much spirit and so much energy, and everybody sort of started to take notice. And uh, I just remember that as sort of uh, the turning point. It was a great, uh, great event, and then now, the Lodge sends over, you send over a hundred kids to Conclave a year. They charter uh, a bus to take the kids to Conclave now. Uh, in 2011, uh, Michael stepped down, at the end of 2011, Michael stepped down as Lodge Advisor, would go on to be the uh, new Section Advisor for the new Section N1, where they merged the, the Southern New England and Northern New England into a big section of 12 Lodges. And they asked Michael to take that over, so he did that. And Bob DeFelice, who had been a long time uh, leader in the Lodge, charter member of Abnaki, been on our leadership team from day one, became Lodge advisor. And then in January 1 of 13, Brian Arinella over there replaced me as staff advisor, and these two really just took it to the next level. Uh, and uh, that's where they started getting 100 plus kids to uh, Conclave, they're taking huge contingents to NOAC, and they continue to grow the membership, and continue to grow the money, did great things at the properties, and just a tremendous leadership team. Very proud of everything that they continue to do. Is Elliot over there? If he stood up, you'd all recognize him. Uh, this was at the conclave at Yago in 2012. And this is a, a, just a quick funny aside. We hadn't hosted a conclave at Yago in 20 years. So this was the first conclave that we did at Yagu, and this was, I think, the Friday. And Elliot and Eric were hanging this sign on the gateway out on the road, if you've ever been to Yagu. And uh, apparently it really ticked off the Yagu Alumni Association that they put an OA sign on the Yagu sign. Because I say bravo. <laughs> and then uh, Elliot, over here, was elected section chief at that conclave, and he is the first and only Session Chief uh, from Abnaki Lodge, and 
he would go on to serve at the national level, oversaw all OA operations at the National Jamboree, and is still very, very active uh, in the order of the Army. <laughs> so, NOAC 2012, another just a funny story. Dan Burgoyne, uh, where's Dan Burgoyne? Dan Burgoyne was the, uh, the, the advisor to NOAC, and the night before we're leaving, the night before, we're going to the car rental agency to pick up the van and the SUV, and one of our leaders calls us and said, we've had a family medical event, and I can't come. So the problem with this is, you know about 2D leadership and all that sort of stuff, so we started to panic because we didn't have enough adults to get these kids to know it. The next morning, so we're in the car and we call Bob D. Police, who's the lodge advisor, and I say, what happened? And then we have a problem. And he starts laughing. Ha, 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 you guys are so funny. I'll buy you a beer later. You can't fool me. I said, no, 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 I'm really serious. This is a problem. Oh, ha, ha, ha. And, and, and I'm not even exaggerating when I tell you that this went on for like three or four minutes. He refused to believe us that we were telling the truth. And it, it was one of those things where it was so ridiculous it became comical. And he starts laughing. And of course, Bob can hear it. You know, and he thinks that we're, we're pulling his chain. Um, but in the end, uh, um, we got his attention finally, I think a few strong words, and he's like, oh, wait. But we had to, uh, we had to get Bob Serhal and uh, Brandon Morris from the Grand Manadnock Lodge to come with us so that we could get those kids uh, to and from the NOAA. But uh, great event, we stopped at um, Niagara Falls, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Cedar Park Amusement Park, and the uh, Baseball Hall of Fame on the way back. And I can tell you, that they just barely managed not to kill each other in the van. Uh, it's just some of the great lodges we had in Randy and John Kelly, uh, terrific leaders uh, of our lodge over the years, and uh, still active uh, today. John Kelly actually lives in Wilmington, where I live now, and Nick Randy, I think, serves as a medical officer for a lot of our ordeals. I call this the Oracles. <laughs> the granddaddy of New Bedford Scouting means the granddaddy of Fall River Scouting. Uh, I'm pretty sure that they were both at Brown Sea with Big Powell. Uh, but what a tremendous privilege uh, to be with these gentlemen and the contributions that they have made uh, to scouting and the commitment, the lifetime commitment is just, it knows no evil. So. And, and finally, just to wrap up, you know, when I think about the Order of the Arrow and, and those years, the first thought is always the people. The memories and, and the time that we spent with the people. These exceptional young men who I still count as close personal friends today, the adults, Michael and Bob, and Dave and Brian and everyone else, um, it, it truly was a privilege and uh, I'm glad that we've been able to document this history so that those who come later know where we've been and what people have done to get us there. With that, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, share with you some history of the the era. I'm going to invite Dave Paulson to come up and talk briefly about Tolbe, and then we'll take any pictures uh, questions that you may have. <laughs> So, I'm from originally from the Anawak Council, Troop 40 and Todd. My first summer camp uh, was the summer after divorce closed or Boy Scout program. So I went to, went to Cash Lot my entire time as a scout. It was a tremendous sight. Like, James West, week two, the entire time, um, from the mid 90s up to the early 2000s. Also a member of the Association, which I think is incredible, which has served as a model of inspiration for the Norse alumni which I would love it to get to this point one day. Um, it's not there yet, but by all means, Dennis and Brian have a huge, huge uh, source of uh, information and resources. So to me, the War of the Arab, by its mission, is rooted in service, camping, and the youth-run organization. I was given that opportunity when I was a youth. And the way I see it with what I do now as a lodge advisor, I'm giving the opportunity back. Hopefully all the, all the youth over there, the youth members that are in the room, hopefully you feel like you're being empowered 
and have fun, succeed, and provide some great service. If not, let me know, then I'll let you do my job. Um, so I'm going to go through some quick uh, history things here. First off, the lodge was formed in 1943, August of 1943. Interestingly enough, in 1941, the council, the Animal Council, wanted to investigate this order of the era. And so they, so they deferred to the Camping Committee to do some research and investigation. Then in 1943, the first were deal happened. So for some reason, from 1941 to 1943, even though it was approved by the council, the charter was not issued. So maybe because it's World War II, they had to find the right people to take it over. That's some of, some of the history there. The first ceremony actually took place at Loon Pond Scout Camp, which is, was the, then became the Ted Williams Camp, is now conservation land in uh, Freetown Lake. And that was um, the, the first uh, ordeal or uh, ceremony was actually posted by the King Philip Lodge, the Boston uh, Council. We returned that favor uh, later on to, to Squantum Lodge when they had their first ordeal. So we're paying for it. And that's all in the book, and also throw the paperwork and kind of artifacts that, that, are, that are over on that back table. Once again, paying it forward to get the next generation engaged. So here's that actual um, board minutes from 1941 saying, hey, what does go away? Well, we, we should look into it. That was March. Come June, hey, this is a great opportunity for our council. Let's do it. And then a few years later, we got a charter for the Oak the Era. The first about five years, not a whole lot of information about who was the lodge chief or the lodge advisor. Uh, we pursued to Bruce Collins, who was the son of the scout executive, who later became a professional in this area briefly. The first reveal class was 25 members, adults and youth from the Anwan Council, which is 11 uh, cities and towns neighboring us today. It wasn't until that December when they decided to meet as a group to figure out how can they best serve the 50 troops of the Anwan Council. There's Bruce Collins. The first insignia is actually this purple shell um, slide. And apparently the, the, the myth is you go to Darby Pond, you find yourself a small turtle, but you hollow it out, it makes up a slide. Boom, now, now you're a full-fledged full member of Topia Lodge 245. And that's actually the uh, the first membership card. Big thanks to Boyd for I think uh, finding that for us. And so Jonathan is a tremendous resource for history, and because of him, constantly calling me and bugging me about it, you have to go out hit the streets, ask questions. Got this nice uh, charter uh, slip from the National Scouting Archives. It kind of shows the membership over time who the lodge chief was in the early years. Some of the early paperwork, which is all on that back table, is this early 1955, hey, you're now eligible for the Brotherhood, please join us. And so Tommy Foster was the first, uh, his president, the first uh, lodge chief in kid that year. One interesting note, the early lodge in the 1950s to the early 1960s were all waterfront staff. And so I'm not sure why that was the case, but all of them were on the waterfront in that time frame. Some photos of the, uh, the 1960s, the first actual live class, which is uh, here, came about in 1957. There was much debate about what species of turtle should this be. Is it a box turtle on land? Is it a pond turtle? What's going on? So, Brian Mashraff, me, a superpathologist in the room, is a painted turtle, which is found throughout our uh, council. Pretty easy to be seen. And over the years, you know, once again, the 60s were a good time for the Lodge. They just formed a dance team called Black Eagle Dancers, and apparently, um, according to the notes, they had 24 members and there was a waiting list. So it was a, a pretty high esteem to be a, a part of that group. The <coughs> we drove in the 1960s, 1970s, appears to continue on that same course. Of course, we'll go through now. This is the 1970s leadership team right there. So it's got a ramp or some event. 1971 um, actually was the first uh, conclave held at Camp Norris by Tolpe Lodge. 1982 was the second conclave held 
at uh, held by copay lots, except when it came past you. So the reason for that is uh, when the river's be at Norse, Camp Norse, it was a scheduling conflict for a, uh, a religious holiday. Our time is that advisor, uh, he's Muslim, and it was a holiday that he could not participate, so they moved it to a different camp to account for his un unavailability. And so it was that cash a lot. Unfortunately, it was not well run uh, financially, and so there was a big shake up uh, of lost money and whatnot. But full circle again, the honored guest was uh, Bart Star, Brad Star, who was the um, national chief of the Order of Yarra from now John Lamar's council. So kind of go full circle here on all these points of the connection. See, this is more of the youth there. This picture is really important. Once again, you see his connection back to the case of Winchek and Pope presenting a um, honorary Howard Fowler to Mansfield. He was the, the adult who really pushed the authority I established in the Anna One Council. He also was the editor of the Mansfield newspaper. There's me back when I had more hair and all hair head. Um, that's when I received the Founders Award in 2002. This is Youth Led. This is an example of servant leadership. Our lodge chief, Dustin Benoit, at the time, said, you know what, this is right around the time of Katrina. I want to make a difference. So he organized a trip, two trips actually, down to Mississippi to help in the recovery. Both, you know, box trucks full of goods and supplies, as well as a staff of power to help serve alongside those communities. So one person making a huge difference. This was the last uh, conclave held at Camp Norse. This is 2011. And we had our largest staff ever. There's over 100 youth and adults there servicing the um, section of, of any one B. In uh, 2003, I drove a photo of it. That was a big year. So, back a little bit up further, the late 1980s to the mid 1990s was a dark period for the Order of the Era. In part, the name really lost its way. There was a lot of infighting between the youth and adults. And in the, in the binary, you got to see letters to the council. Youth having great concern for the adult advisorship, how it was not properly run, the advisors not liking the youth. So much so, resignation letters flying around everywhere. It was a real mess, and the program suffered. By the late 90s, things started to turn around, started to build momentum. In 2003, it was a challenge. Well, we had coaches since the 80s. No one, no one can do it. They're small. Forget about it. That event really set the mark and the energy in the room to be to be successful, which led into the eventual merger with that Mac 102. And that kind of chip on your shoulder that you can't do it. It was a huge factor to rally the troops, to rally the scouts, to help out that day, to get donations and all the rest. And uh, just add, so Tolpe is known. And even to this day, it's known for high spirit and energy. That all really started the inspiration of the Nemat Lodge. 1998, Conkling, at Treasure Valley, out in Worcester, Massachusetts. At that event, Nemat Lodge, they had about six people there, but they were all dressed as pirates, running around, making a lot of noise, a lot of spirit, high energy. And they were the first recipient of the Golden Shovel, that giant monstrosity they saw in uh, Jonathan's uh, slide deck. I'm thinking to myself, a lodge that small, that much energy, that much passion and heart, nothing can stop it. And so then, when I was a lodge officer in Tolpe uh, 245, we have to replicate that. That lightning in the bottom. And today that carries through. So as, as you can know, there's a lot of swag, from shirts to stickers to whatever, whatever you guys want, it's, just, it's all about you and getting excited about the order of the hour the service. This was the last ordeal. This is the uh, Camp Norse Ceremony site, full dining hall. This is what we'd like to see. This was the vigil reunion that was held at um, Camp Norse. This is the 2015 <coughs> conclave at Yagi. And this was a point in this day that sticks in my mind. That June, where it talks about our council merging, they're against the council of the animal council. And all the youth were in the parade field. And you know, you had like that kind of camp banter, you know, 
who can sing louder, make fun of each other in a very respectful way. And they started chanting one of us. And at first I'm like, are we taunting the other one of the virgin? Then both lodges started to sing. And it really set the tone for the eventual merger that happened in 2016. The youth were, were right-minded. Granted, it's the third merger now, so it's a good time to charm. The right adults were in the room. And we are very successful as of a strong foundation of cheerful service and servant leadership. So, okay, thank you for all you. Thank you for the youth that made this possible. Awesome. So with that, that's basically the story. Sorry about having heart, but also never forgetting where you come from. So thank you.